Why, hello, welcome to our second live panel for the NIH Career Symposium for 2020. We're really excited to um, have you here for the second panel for industry R&D. Um, I'm gonna hand you off to your moderator, Supreet, but just a few notes as we get started. First, if you need closed captioning, please look within the chat function or just ask us a question. We'll happily send you the closed captioning link. Second, follow us on Twitter um, at uh, NIH underscore OIT. And third, um, you guys have an amazing volume of questions is what we've learned. We will not be able to get to all of your questions. We will do the best we can to promote the questions up through your two moderators, which are Supreet and Alex, and they will ask the questions to the different speakers. So please um, ask away. We might not get to your question. We apologize. And we'll, we are going to download the questions, do some AI on those questions, and provide um, links next week. Um, on some of the most popular answers. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Supreet and I'm gonna go away. Thank you so much, Laurie. Um, hello everyone, uh, I and Alex, uh, who is moderating this session with me, would like to welcome everyone to uh, the industry R&D career panel. This is the second panel of the day and um, we are having the NIH career symposium virtually, I guess for the first time and Looks like there are almost 2,000 attendees. So welcome to all the attendees and especially to all the panelists who are here. So um, we have three panelists from industry. We have Denise, uh, we have Samantha, and then Catherine is on the call. Uh, uh, she had some technical issues, which we are living in right now in these situations. Uh, so she'll be, she'll be, she's available to answer your questions. Um, uh, but she, you won't be able to see her. So um, once again, welcome everyone. Um, and I would like to start the panel um, by asking all the panelists to uh, give a brief introduction about themselves and talk about their current uh, responsibilities at their respective uh, um, industry. So uh, we can start with Denise. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Denise De Jesus. I, um, in my current role, I am the Vice President of Scientific Operations at Remedy Plan Therapeutics. We are a small oncology therapeutics company located in Gatesburg, Maryland. And our, my goal is to facilitate a team of uh, multidisciplinary experts uh, in developing, identifying, and validating brand new cancer uh, small molecule therapeutics. Uh, we've been operating for about four years. I actually was the first employee at my company and there are, uh, we just hired, so there are nine of us at the company. So I've been from just being two of us, uh, the founder and myself, all the way now to leading a team of uh, seven individuals. Awesome. Uh, Samantha, do you want to uh, go ahead and uh, talk about um, your role? Sure. Uh, as you said, I'm Samantha Yost. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming and listening. Um, I currently am a scientist two, recently promoted from scientist one at Regenix Bio. We are a, a medium-sized uh, biotech company uh, focused on AAV-directed gene therapy. Uh, we're located in Rockville, Maryland. And um, I currently am in the Gene Transfer Technologies Group in R&D, and um, I'm mainly focusing on capsid engineering um, in order to more focus the um, AAV capsid to either transduce specific tissues for certain disease indications or um, increase overall transduction or, you know, a number of other character characteristics, characteristics of the AAV capsid. Awesome. Katrine? Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everybody. Again, apologies, you can't see me, um, but we must go on. So I'm a scientist too at Biogen up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I have been there for about four years uh, since completing my PhD. And um, I work on the preclinical side of research uh, in Parkinson's disease therapies. So we're a neuroscience um, focused company, uh, medium size, about 7,500 employees globally. And 
uh, my role as a scientist too in the movement disorders Parkinson's disease group is uh, to support uh, the drug development at the very early stages, discover new targets that we can uh, go after to treat Parkinson's disease. And um, I have a role currently in supporting or leading uh, programs in antisense oligonucleotides, using antisense oligonucleotides, uh, gene therapy, and small, molecule, small, small molecules. Okay. Great. Uh, welcome once again. So um, I would like to open um, the floor by asking you questions and people in the audience um, are, I can see already, are, we have tons of questions and Alex will be helping us with those. So uh, what I would like to um, know about, uh, can you talk about uh, the work environment in your respective industries? Like I know Denise is from startup. Um, Katharina is in uh, bigger pharma, Samantha is in kind of um, uh, middle-sized pharma. So uh, it will give us a little bit more idea about how the um, work environment is in different size pharma. So uh, perhaps we can start from Samantha this time. Sure. Um, I actually graduated with my PhD in 2016, and then I spent about a year at um, Bristol Myers Squibb. So I do you have a little bit of information um, regarding comparison between that large pharma and like a kind of small to medium-ish biotech? Right. Um, I found the large pharma company just to really be not for me. Um, I felt like I was kind of another cog in the wheel and didn't have a big impact. Um, I was also a contractor, so I was often left out of the loop as to where my projects were going or where they came from, which I didn't care for. <laughs> Um, in contrast to that, at uh, Regenex, I really love the size that we are now, um, and I feel like I have a big impact on where we're going in the future, which is really validating. Um, everyone, even though ha everyone has their own niches, um, you are kind of forced to be a jack of all trades um, because not everyone can do everything. So if um, someone from analytical comes to you and says, hey, I have this molecular bio project um, or question that I need answered, what should I do? Can you help me? I'm going to help with them. <laughs> so um, at least in R&D, we're kind of um, interfacing with a lot of different groups, which I enjoy. Um, you get to see the fruits of your labor, so to speak, which is um, really validating. So I enjoy it. Awesome, yeah. Uh, Catherine, uh, would you like to talk about um, your experience at the Big Pharma? Yeah, so um, Biogen still has a kind of a smaller biotech feel to it in terms of the research area. I would say my experience is kind of similar to Samantha's at Regenix where um, so our, my, my group is kind of structured similarly to an academic lab. We have senior scientists, um, mid-tier, we have associate scientists and even postdocs, uh, at times. And, um, and we're, we have different disease groups. So maybe five core groups of, uh, researchers. And then we have, um, core, uh, facilities that support us in our work. And I would say on a daily basis, it's it's just a very collaborative environment, and the there's definitely a necessity and uh, an openness to uh, collaborate with people from all different kinds of functions. Um, I would say, even though it's a larger company uh, represented in this panel, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity to. Uh, get your hands, uh, you know, experienced in in different modalities and different kinds of research, and um, interacting with a lot of different people. And and the project teams uh, to lead programs, you always have a wide range of expertise, ranging from chemistry to biology to bioinformatics. So I would say it's pretty free ranging, and at least the culture at Biogen is very kind of open. Um, whether you know someone or not, you can approach someone, and they're very helpful and willing to get involved. So um, that's been my experience there. Okay, great. Um, Denise, so how has your experience been working in a startup? Yes, uh, some of the experiences are actually really similar to what Samantha and Catherine have talked about. However, I would like to drive people from uh, the differences between when you're the first employee went to their 10 employees, because 
when I was the first employee, for example, uh, I it meant that I was involved uh, doing experiments at the bench while also reading about the business and how what type of therapies we could approach, how the best way to look for investors, how to bring money, which is very similar in academic setting when you think about looking for a grant, right, to support your research. Um, it gets to a point in a small company where you realize you're doing a lot. Uh, you are, uh, yeah, I am in the small molecule field, so you know I was the biologist, but I also was the chemist. And unfortunately, we didn't have uh, those experts at hand, so that meant that it was time to hire new individuals and bring them on board. And so with time, now that there's 10 of us, we do have a split into groups, and we do have now a biology arm and a chemistry arm. Uh, everyone within the company, even though their roles are uh, established, like in any big company, um, their day-to-day -day work and the responsibilities always go beyond uh, what is on the contract. Um, every employee wears multiple hats. Um, everyone, in at least in our company, we have a transparency uh, in motto in our company where everyone knows how the decisions get made. Uh, how the projects are chosen. Everyone has a saying in terms of the culture that they want to implement into the company. And everyone has the ability also to present their results to our investors and get to meet the people that fund their research. Um, as we grow up, actually, I know that that's not gonna be, continue to happen. Uh, we are gonna have to start to become way more focused in order to accomplish our goals. So in a small company uh, of less than 10 individuals, you do have an overall understanding of what's happening and when, um, but then you also, things move really fast and you also encounter that you have to be flexible because the changes mean that uh, the focus change as well. Okay, great. Um, so I would like uh, Alex to um, uh, start uh, asking questions from the chat box. It seems like we have already have several questions. So Alex, can you help me with the questions from the chat box? Yes, uh, we got a lot of questions. Um, people are wondering whether any of the panelists did a postdoc. And if not, um, in general, is a postdoc, you know, how important is a postdoc to find for finding a position in industry? Yeah, so we can start with Denise. Yes, I actually did a postdoctoral fellowship at NIH in the Laboratory of Infectious Disease under the amazing Dr. Kim Green. It was a great experience. Uh, I actually uh, didn't say this, but my uh, PhD is in molecular microbiology, and then, um, but I was always interested in host pathogen and interactions. So my, my point actually was in host pathogens interactions as well. Uh, my company though is an oncology company. Uh, and uh, what I learned through my postdoc is that the skills are really transferable. I took that opportunity to number one, to see um, like my experiences as a PhD student, how other people were doing research in their labs. I use that opportunity as now that I manage the lab to see what things were working for me as a postdoc and things were not working. So I use that information. Um, the skills are transferable. Uh, you manage projects, uh, you manage uh, the research, uh, you manage uh, uh, postdocs or grad students. So having a postdoc, um, it is beneficial in the sense that you acquire the extra experience. However, it's not necessary. Uh, I have friends and I know people that we've hired without the postdoctoral experience. I think that when, no matter where you go, an important thing is always think how your skill sets are gonna transfer and provide a value for the company that you're seeking to work for. Okay, yeah. And I know Catherine did a, a short postdoc and then moved to industry. So Catherine, do you, uh, want to add anything to what Denise just said? Yeah, so um, I only did, I was maybe a postdoc for about four months after uh, completing my PhD in 2016, and it was in my graduate lab, so it was really just uh, as I was transitioning and looking for, for a job, and um, 
I, I mean, I would say though that I was lucky that that postdoc experience, the couple minor projects that I uh, supported during that short time, were actually um, uh, involved with uh, NCATS and and an external LLC company. So so I actually you know could play that up a little when I wanted to move to industry, you know, because I got a little bit of insight there through those projects mm -hmm. into um, uh, how drugs were developed, and I had had got a tiny bit of experience there, but my background was mitochondrial biology and autophagy, um, very molecular cellular science. And um, uh, what happened for me to transition to industry, uh, even though I didn't have a lot of postdoc experience, uh, was I kept up my connections with uh, previous uh, postdocs in my NIH lab, because I did my PhD um, through the NIH Cambridge program. And um, it was someone who, a postdoc from my NIH lab that I overlapped with as a graduate student, and he went on to Biogen a year before me. And then when they uh, started to form the Parkinson's disease group, um, my name came up and, and he was able to connect me. So it really was through keeping up with that network that I was able to, to get my foot into industry, I would say, maybe sooner than I would have otherwise. And I can echo what Denise said that, um, you know, postdoc is not necessary. I'm pretty much evidence of that. Um, you know, if you can fit the right science or the need, but uh, I would say more often than not, I do see that most people have um, postdoc experience uh, coming into these uh, different scientist positions, and I think it's really just more, um, you know, it makes them more competitive and such. But uh, you can get around that uh, depending on your experience. Okay, that's great, uh, Alex. Do you have another question for us? Yes, um, a lot of people are asking um, the recruitment process at your respective um, companies, and maybe you can also discuss how you landed your job. Yeah, so we can start with Samantha this time. Sure. Um, my story is actually pretty similar to Catherine's. I stayed at my uh, PhD lab for about nine months. Um, before finding a contractor position at, at Bristol Myers Quibb, which I was uh, recommended for by a former grad student batchmate. Um, so again, those connections are really, really important. Um, if all you can find is a contractor position, obviously it's not ideal, but it absolutely gets your foot in the door. Um, I learned a lot about CRISPR technology during that year, which really helped me. Um, during when I was a candidate for Regenics. Um, also, I have a structural biology background, which they were interested in. So that particular combination just worked for that position. Um, if I can kind of go back to the last question and uh, say that none of the scientist ones in our group have a postdoc. Um, so I agree that it's not absolutely necessary. Obviously, every company is gonna have their own definition of scientist one, two, three, senior scientist, whatever. Yeah. Um, but there are absolutely companies out there that, that do not require it, and you will still be a competitive candidate. Um, beyond that, when I was uh, being recruited by Regenix, um, the interview process was an on-site that they paid for me to go um, and talk to a bunch of people, including the CSO, the director of the group, um, my direct manager, that sort of thing, um, after a phone interview. and um then they got back to me pretty quick about a week later so i think if if a company really wants you they'll be quick about it and try not to let them drag their feet too much <laughs> oh, that's great yeah denise did you have any um other experience or you had similar experience with samantha yes actually it was really similar to herds and even catherine um like i said i i actually was uh, doing my postdoc I had spent a few years there and I was not looking, I, I was not actively looking for an opportunity, but I had made good friends with an old postdoc where I did my lab work uh, back at Tufts University. And he was about to start a company or he had just started a company actually. Uh, when he approached me saying, you know, we've worked together. I know that we can work really well together. Uh, would you like to come on board and help me set up um, the next stage of my company? At that point, he only had uh, been working for a few months. 
And so it was a really difficult decision. Uh, it was a really unique opportunity for me to advance my career really fast uh, compared to uh, being in a large organization. Um, and obviously represented a lot of challenges because I was not an oncologist. And so this is where I go back to, you know, use your skill sets and understand that they're transferable. So I took the challenge and I decided to quit my postdoc at NIH. It, and, and since then, it's been an amazing experience. And however, uh, the recruitment process within the company has changed. Uh, in fact, I don't think any one of the current employees we have have come up from a personal connection. They all have been applying through uh, Indeed or LinkedIn. And so I want to tell people out there that there are multiple options to find the job that you would like. Obviously, if you do know someone, reach out. And if you know someone that knows someone, still reach out. Uh, it's really important to make those connections. You might be applying for job A, but once you're talking to the person, they say, you know, you're not good for a good fit for the position, for the things that I'm looking to have in my company. But I know Samantha and she, her company is looking and I now know Catherine and now I know Biogen is looking. And that's how also you can make the connections. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks like from all of your experiences, um, there is a common theme of uh, knowing your network and then that that always helps um, getting the, the foot in the door, getting a, your first job right. in the industry. Right? And I actually applied through LinkedIn, so you don't always need a connection. Um, yeah. And also, even if you don't seem like a perfect fit for a job, absolutely apply if they ask you to come in or talk to them on the phone it's a good impression they'll think of you in the future and keep your resume on hand for anything that comes up awesome yeah alex another question yes i think we briefly touched upon this i think maybe samantha mentioned it but um there's a lot of questions on the chat regarding decision titles and i think it probably varies like or you're a scientist one scientist two and i think this probably varies a lot between you know companies but in general maybe you could just mention at least in your company a new grad student or a new post or you know a new postdoc where would they what position would they apply to yeah so we can start with Catherine. yeah biogen uh a phd uh scientist would come in at the scientist one level potentially scientist two if uh if they have you know more experience or something, uh, non PhD so bachelor and master students tend to come in more at the associate scientist level, and there are one uh, I think at Biogen now it's associate two and three. There's also um, senior scientists and principal scientists, um, which kind of fit into that ladder at various stages depending. Um, uh, but I would say straightforwardly for you know if you're coming out of grad school you know, scientist one, and then you could get promoted to two and above. Okay. Samantha, do you have a different structure in your company or is it kind of similar? Uh, very similar. The associate scientists would be people with bachelors and masters. Um, we do have a senior associate, um, which I don't think we have of any of in R&D, um, but in technical operations, you can be recruited out of your PhD as a senior associate, but more often um, as a scientist one in R&D. Um, scientists two are mostly people with um, at least some postdoc experience. And then beyond that, we have principal scientists, uh, or senior scientists and then principal scientists. Okay. Uh, Denise, is, are there any differences in a startup? Uh, or the positions are kind of similar when you... When you the, they have different names. Uh, something that it sounds funny as i say it but you can you create the positions as you go no. <laughs> and so you do learn you know i need a person with a biochemistry uh skill set uh most likely with mechanism expertise and then you say who would be and it'll be all right a scientist one level would be a person with uh coming out of a phd uh also someone with many years experience we also have it as a scientist too for those students coming out of their bachelor's as well as their master's. Um, uh, we have research associates and technicians and associates positions for them. However, uh, we also are looking, we're open. Uh, we don't think that a scientist, it's only a person with a PhD. We also will consider a person, let's say with a master's degree, 
that have had eight or 10 years of experience is really talented uh, to be also promoted. Okay, 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 great. Um, Alex, can we have another question, please, from the audience? Yes. Um, how did you decide, or more like, why did you choose industry versus academia or government? Yeah, so uh, we can start with Samantha this time. Sure. Um, <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> and also um, opportunity to be directly involved in things regarding um, clinical trials. Um, not having to write grants is awesome. Um, and particularly about Regenics um, is that it's the company is not solely reliant on um, our clinical trials for revenue because we also mm -hmm. uh, license our products to other companies. So if anyone's heard of, of Zolgensma, which was recently approved um, by Novartis for spinal muscular atrophy, mm -hmm. um, that is one of our AV9 products. So we also get money that way. Um, that puts a lot less pressure on R&D to produce the next big thing. Um, we're a lot more stable than the small biotechs out there who are kind of um, nose to the grindstone every single day towards their first clinical candidate. Um, we have a lot more freedom to operate in uh, things that are maybe a little more risky. Um, so in my view, that's uh, a really great combination of the good things of academia. You can research what you think is cool and maybe a little bit more risky and the security of uh, a larger pharma because we have that backup pipeline of, of licensing. Okay, Denise, do, uh, do you have anything more to add to that? Yes, I actually wanted to be an academic. Um, that's why I decided to do my postdoc at NIH and the, and the research, the particular research that I was doing was I was I am born and raised in Puerto Rico, so my whole life, I if people knew me, I will say I'm gonna finish my PhD. I'm gonna then go my do my postdoc and start my own lab. But then inside of me, I also knew, and so it wasn't until I was approached by uh, this old colleague of mine that I actually had given it a little serious thought to industry. Uh, in a startup environment, money is not the driver. <laughs> it, um, you know, there is a big a learning curve and there is a, a fast career progression but but in the early stages money is not a driver um, but what really caught my attention was that i could use everything i've learned and and put it into practice for example i always knew i wanted to be involved in management so i saw move into industry as an opportunity to accelerate that of my path had i stayed in an academic path it would have taken me a lot more longer publish many more papers compete with way more people in order to have my own lab. Uh, where right now, it was an accelerated path in a small company, uh, and that really, really uh, was attracted to me. Okay, okay, great. Um, Alex, do you have another question for us? Um, yes, a lot of people are wondering about publications. How important is it to have? Okay, so uh, Catherine, do you want to share your perspective on that, whether publications are important to get an industry job? Yeah, I mean, I think for any scientist position, publications are important. I think they play maybe, you know, especially for getting that first position. It it's just gives confidence, especially if you don't, you're not working off of your network to get a job. Uh, it gives confidence to the hiring um, uh, institution that, you know, that you, you know, have proven expertise and, you know, and they can kind of judge you by some of that, that work that you've accomplished. Um, uh, but I, I don't think they're as important as landing like a professor, uh, you know, in an academic institution. Okay. Uh, my experience within Biogen too, um, and I don't know how widespread this is, but they certainly encourage publication. So I'm actually working on a couple manuscripts right now from work that isn't proprietary uh, anymore. But it is harder to publish once you enter industry. So. Once you move into industry, I think moving back to academia can can be difficult uh, unless you keep up that publication record. And I will just say, just because of the nature of the work, you know, it, you tend to publish publish less. But um, it's still highly encouraged, at least uh, in my experience. Okay, uh, Denise, uh, right, yeah. 
how how is it in the startup do you guys publish a lot or is it something yeah. uh, not uh, much so i want to split the question into two one do i need all these publications to get the job into industry and then how we tackle that in my uh, industry mm -hmm. so first you don't need 5000 or like 100 or 50 publications i think what you need to show is that you can take a project lead it and get to answers um, I look at publications so much different than I used to before. I look to see, can you work on a team if there are multiple authors uh, or are you more independent? Can you lead a project? For example, if you are the first author of that publication, that already tells me if it's a candidate with a lot of first authors versus it's a candidate that's always like uh, their name is always somewhere within the list of authors that is telling me something about the work style of that person and whether that's what I'm looking for at the moment or not. So that's really valuable. And, and when you're applying, you should address those things. I'm a team player, or I really have taken this project and take it the lead. Uh, in terms of publication, because like uh, Catherine mentioned, everything is proprietary. We do not publish scientific articles. It is within our goals to publish them once we have the uh, the need but another way you can create if you if you something that you care about is uh showing evidence of your hard work we do publish patents and so for example we a lot of us have not had any scientific publication but we've had patents uh, in, in which we are inventors and your research is there and they're written pretty similarly to uh, how you would in a scientific article okay great uh, and I think you touched on it a little bit about um, being a team player. So someone um, asked us uh, before, you know, when we received questions before the panel, before the live panel, was that when people are switching from a postdoc to an industry career, uh, um, over a period of time, they will be required to handle teams and, uh, you know, lead projects. So is, is it something that you, um, is it an opportunity that you get in a company to grow into or do you are you required to have some sort of business skills or get a business degree or do you get uh, an opportunity to let's say get an MBA while you're at the company um, so Denise do, would you like yes. to add as a, as um, a startup side well I think it depends on what your personal goals are and what is of really interest to you I do not have an MBA uh, so I didn't think it would be necessary for me to go back to school. Uh, I think I went to school for long enough now. Mm -hmm. uh, I do get the knowledge. Uh, I read a lot about business magazines and, and, and the sort like startup world, what the other people are doing or what people uh, will do. Um, and you always rely on experts. Uh, it's something that uh, struggling difference from when I was a grad student and a postdoc was I was taught to lead my project that this was my research and then I did have collaborators but they were part of the finishing up this one story uh, something I've learned now is uh, the more you collaborate because everyone is working under the same umbrella the better the product will be the more input from ideas are going to be it's no longer a competition of who comes first with the mechanism uh, we all want that mechanism and so we all will contribute to it uh, in terms of team player, because you can be a team player many ways, right? Like you can be the team player that always, after you finish your experiments, you supply the reagents back. That's being a team player. Or you can be the team player that um, is in charge of organizing the team meetings. And then there's there are multiple ways you can be a team player. Um, and in terms of business and getting an MBA is not necessary unless you really, in a small, for example, in a small environment like mine, unless you really want to delve into uh, uh, market research or like how the um, funding environment and investments and notes and and all that jargon that that gets related uh, and how to move yeah. a product forward yeah great samantha do you have anything to add or like how can people uh, develop um, team skills while they're doing their postdoc uh, something that denise did not touch on yeah, I agree with a lot of what Denise said. Um, it really depends on your goals. Um, as a PhD student, I think over the years it takes to get that degree, um, 
you should be thinking about those kinds of things as you progress, um, taking more responsibility over your projects and the direction of your projects. Um, of course, you're going to listen to whatever your PI says as well, but you should be, you know, contributing more scientifically um, to those things, uh, whether it's reaching out to collaborators to see um, if they would either help you with a new experiment you thought of or reaching out to a CRO um, with your new ideas to see if it's feasible for them to, to do experiments for you if you don't have the capacity. Um, I think building connections is kind of the foundation of uh, developing your personal communication and leadership style. Um, so, so yeah, that's really important. And also how you work with your lab mates, um, how you collaborate there, I think is a good indicator of, um, how you're going to work with any future group really. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Alex, do you have another question, please? Yeah. Um, can the panelists describe a typical day at work? Um, maybe kind of commenting on relative proportion of bench work to supervising direct reports, et cetera. So, uh, Katrin, do you want to give your opinion on that? Yeah, so um, I have one associate scientist. Uh, so I, um, you know, meet with her regularly to, you know, design and uh, prioritize experiments. And she tends to be in the lab as an associate scientist, maybe 80% of the time and 20%, you know, maybe analyzing data and going to meetings. Um, my work, uh, especially I'm a biology lead on a couple projects and I help support another one. So I tend to have more meetings. So I would say maybe I'm in the lab 60 to 70 percent of the time, um, though it varies depending. In the next couple of weeks, I have like five presentations to give. So so it definitely comes in waves, I would say. Um, but I otherwise I met in the lab just sort of similar to my academic experience where I'm designing assays, I'm testing compounds, I'm growing cells, I'm uh, and talking to colleagues and collaborating with different groups to um, kind of develop these assays with a focus at uh, supporting a, a particular program and testing out drugs within within a program, for example. Um, but otherwise, our uh, my group structures, uh, you know, we have a weekly lab meeting and a monthly department meeting uh, where people, different people present and there are different uh, opportunities, maybe just touching on the last question as well about, you know, kind of leadership uh, opportunities um, at the kind of larger company that Biogen is, there are um, both, you know, like trainings that you can take and many opportunities to either be a lead on a project as a biologist or um, take a broader um, kind of administrative role as a scientist where you have to um, be the person presenting uh, to governance to request resources, for example, for an in vivo study for your project or so on, or, or give reports on your program because there are these regular kind of checkups uh, 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 within the company. It's kind of, you could say, uh, make it analogous to sort of the grant proposal system, except it's within, it's a company, but you need to, you know, propose things to get money to source your your projects and to get the, the support that you need. Okay, great. Yeah, so we are kind of running short of time, so, uh, and would like to cover more questions from people. So I would request Alex to ask another question. Sure, um, a lot of people are asking about job security in industry. Uh, Denise, would you like to answer that? I think uh, it depends uh, if had you asked that question last year or now. Uh, <laughs> I will say that what has been proven is that scientists, we are now a, 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 a more sick than, than before. Uh, I think that uh, in industry, what we've seen is that the the work has not stopped. Uh, the other way around, actually, we now have even more work to do. Um, mm -hmm. It depends on the stage. So overall, it, it depends on the stage. So for example, my company, every fall, we go and seek new rounds of funding. We do not have a clinical asset. So that means we're 100% dependent on finding investors. Um, 
if we don't find any, if we don't plan ahead or we don't meet the milestones, that means that money is not going to come in when we think it will be. So in that sense, it is in a startup environment, uh, is more risk. You need to, to be willing to take that risk. But when we do have the money, uh, it actually is really safe because it's there. It's just for what we said we were going to do and is not uh, subjected to any outside changes like the market, for example, if you were working on a public company. Okay, okay. Samantha, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I, I guess I touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, when I started at Regenex, I was employee number 140. So um, I think that's still kind of small. <laughs> but as I said before, we were a little bit more secure because we had that licensing pipeline as well to support us um, beyond just investors. And we are a publicly traded company. Um, so mm -hmm. there is always that kind of cloud over your head, like, oh, is our company going to get purchased today by XYZ? I have no idea. Um, on one hand, that would be great because we would probably get a lot more money. Um, on the other hand, is my department going to be let go because we're now redundant? You just don't know. Um, but I think we're a little bit, uh, like I said, more secure than than really tiny kind of startups, um, but probably not, you know, on the scale of Bristol Myers Squibb or Gilead or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we have time for probably two or three more questions. So one of the questions that people have asked in the chat box is like, and we have touched on some of the soft skills like team player leadership skills, but what are some of the other soft skills that we probably haven't talked about that are highly attractive in a candidate? So Catherine, would you like to give your perspective? Yeah, I just say the biggest thing is um, kind of management and leadership skills. So whether I know I, at the NIH, I took advantage of a different like management workshops and and presenting your work, but that and uh, maybe showing building skills through collaborations, whether it's with people within the lab working on your project or with external collaborators, you know, that takes a lot of uh, work to you know effective to have effective communication and and coordinate things especially if you're you know sending samples or, or sharing or you know teaching techniques or something across labs or something and and so those things definitely come into play if you have more experience working with people with different expertises because you really run into that I think even more in industry okay uh, Samantha do you have anything else to add to that yeah, I think a really important skill is advocating for yourself. Um, it's extremely helpful, not only when you are interviewing, obviously you want to get the job, so you wanna say how awesome you are. And as weird and awkward as that feels, it's very important. And even though um, you're maybe not in academia anymore writing grants, you still have to convince you know, your manager or whoever that your research is important or the new experiment you thought up uh, deserves to be funded or if you want to organize a sponsored research uh, agreement with an outside organization that uh, you have to show why that's important uh, or will will contribute to the company somehow so i think advocating for you and your research is really important okay awesome so i think we have time for one more question um uh, alex do you want to uh, ask the question um, can you comment on work-life balance in industry? Okay, Denise, sorry I interrupted you. Do you want to answer that question? Sure. Uh, yes, so we have the benefit in my company to establish what type of company we want to be and what type of company we don't want to be. And at least our remedy plan, we have established that we want people, happy people that come to work. And that means uh, people who have the time to go home, visit their family, spend time, go on vacations. Uh, we have a really flexible schedule. Um, I often find myself telling people, all right, time to close computers, let's go, let's go to social hour, uh, go, uh, you know, scientists, sometimes we cannot control it, but have to work on weekends. So that I, all right, you work this two weekends in a row, then you should take Monday off. And it's given within the company that we provide that flexibility. And for me, that's really important. Um, I get to work at 10 a.m. and everyone knows this. And so if you want to meet with me, either over the phone or like at 10 a.m. And but we have people that get in at 7:30 a.m. Right. And so that ability of everyone to 
to have that balance is, I think, part of the success. Okay, Samantha, uh, do you want to add anything? What Denise yeah, said? our our company culture is also really flexible. Uh, like Denise's, we have a lot of younger new parents at our company so a lot of people with small children around um, there's always an understanding around oh i need to go pick up my kid from xyz um, i need to take so and so to the doctor there's no you know clucking in and out and being really meticulous about your hours um, if you need to leave early it's fine if you get your work done that's all right no sweat off anyone's back um of course as denise said sometimes science happens on the weekend and you have to be there and then you just take a couple of comp hours somewhere else um it's very flexible we have um a lot of company get-togethers throughout the year we have a picnic we have a christmas party or holiday party um and i'm really lucky that our group in r d is fairly close we're actually during this quarantine time having a happy hour online every week which is really nice everyone has their kind of beer in hand on on virtual skype so yeah the, okay. the culture is really great all right great awesome uh katherine uh, Ka do you have um a, um a different type of work-life balance or is it similar to what we already talked about Nope. I would say uh, a lot of the things that Denise and Samantha mentioned are also happening at Biogen, you know, and with a larger company, there's even extra benefits um, of, you know, having a, a gym on site and child daycare available yeah. too for, for parents. So, um, and I know different companies do that as well. Um, but yeah, so, but essentially, yeah, happy hours, good work-life balance, good amount of vacation time and so on. Really good. Awesome. Yeah. That's great, yeah. So do you guys have any other advice to share before we close this? Uh, anything else that we didn't talk yes. about? Or, I, yeah. I mean, I will say if you're looking for a job, regardless what industry or size company, I think I, that kind of crossed to me in the last few years is something that Samantha touched upon, buy for yourself. If you're looking for a job, you're always looking for a job. It does not matter if it's an informal interview, if it's the third round of interviews that you go to. Uh, and something that now that I look at applicants, you know, I, I see there are thousands of you out there just in this chat. So a lot of people are just like you, proactive. So when you go into, into the door, just tell the company why it should be you. How can you be better than any of the other people applying? Uh, not just on your skill sets, I have years of experience on this, but uh, understand the vision and the mission of the company and how you can make it better. I think that the candidates that I've seen that have done that, uh, instead of reciting a resume that I can read, have been the best candidates ever. Yeah, that's a great advice. Yeah, thank you so much. So I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you. Yeah. So I'm coming back in to wrap us up today. Uh, Samantha, Denise, and Catherine, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. You guys on the chat have had an amazing volume of questions. And so we are going to work through um, using some AI technology to answer all of them. And we'll get the, all those answers back to you guys next week. I want to point out on our YouTube page, we have a couple of additional items for industry-based careers that you may want to look at. We have some one-on-one -on -one interviews with scientists from BMS, from Genentech, and from Gilead, and also a panel on transitioning into your first industry job with scientists from um, AB Biomed, BMS, Schrodinger, and Atrium. So thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and uh, this will, re will be recorded and it'll be put up on our YouTube page next week. All right, bye everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.